Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 29. <coughs> Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee. Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judgment, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Thank you, Daniel, for the scripture reading and the prayer. And Brother Ralph, thank you for leading those beautiful songs that you have led us in this morning. It is indeed good to be here on this Lord's Day that God has given to us to worship Him in spirit and in truth and to remember His Son, Jesus Christ. Today I want to talk about building on a sure foundation. Building on a sure foundation. Of course, if we listen to the people of the world, we will get the wrong idea of what a sure foundation is. But if we listen to God, and His Son, Jesus Christ, and what the Bible teaches, then we will know what the sure foundation is. We know that Noah built the ark, but he also built his family on the right principles, and he had the right example that he gave for them. In Genesis 6.22, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Today we want to talk about building on the right foundation. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 28 and verse 16, the prophet said, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Now I would like to read Peter in 1 Peter 2, verse number 6. Here he refers to the scripture. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. That is, he shall not be ashamed or have reason for shame or reason to, be, to make haste or be confounded. We know, friends, that the Lord and His Word is the sure foundation. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. The Lord knoweth them that are His, and let everyone that name of the name of Christ depart from iniquity. The song that Brother Rolf led a while ago, My Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I appreciate him leading that song for this lesson today. We must build our hope and our entire life on Christ Jesus. He is the only true foundation. 
as Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Referring to the church in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, Paul refers to the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Verse number 20, referring to the household of God and the saints, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Jesus Christ is the foundation. He's the chief cornerstone. But he also mentions building on the apostles and prophets. In this sense, we are built upon the apostles and prophets. In that, it was through the apostles and prophets after Christ went back to heaven and the Holy Spirit came beginning on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 and began revealing through inspiration God's Word, the New Testament, until the conclusion of the miraculous age and the New Testament was completed, that which was in part, the miracles were done away, according to 1 Corinthians 13, 8, 10. We see that it was through the apostles and the prophets that the Spirit conveyed inspired words to man. So in that sense, we are built upon the apostles and prophets. And of course, Christ is the ultimate foundation. But in order to build on Christ the chief cornerstone, we have to build on the Word of God that has been revealed. We certainly do not want to make the eternally tragic mistake that the Jewish leaders made in Matthew 21 when Christ said of them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures? And this is from Psalm 118. The stone which the builders rejected the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. That headstone of the corner, as we've just read from Peter, is Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. We read that in Paul, Ephesians chapter 2. And also Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 6, uh, <clears throat> verse 7 rather, Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Now in those ancient buildings, the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, was the main part of the foundation. It held the rest of the building together. Now here's the illustration that the Lord uses. Those stones were cut out. A special stone was cut out to fit the chief cornerstone place. And when the chief cornerstone came to earth, Jesus Christ, the only one who would fit, would fit the Old Testament prophecies, the Jewish leaders cast him aside. It would be like builders building a building and when the stone that had been cut out for the chief cornerstone came to them, they cast it aside. They pushed it away. The only one that could be the chief cornerstone and the foundation. That's what the Jewish leaders did to Jesus Christ. The only one who would fit for the foundation stone. But God established him anyway in his building, the church, as the chief cornerstone cornerstone and the head and the Savior thereof, Ephesians 5, verse 23. But now we ask the question today, how do we build on a solid foundation? The sure foundation, how do we do that? Of course we must build on the Lord and His Word is our foundation, but this is directly connected to obedience to the Word of God. I'd like to go to Matthew chapter 7 this morning. And in verse 21, the Lord lays the foundation of the parable that he will teach later, a few verses later, 24, 27. In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Doing the will of God, obedience to the will of God, 
That's the way to lay on the sure foundation of Jesus Christ. The only true foundation that will stand the test of time and will endure throughout eternity. Now, beginning at verse 24, the Lord tells this marvelous parable that we've been acquainted with since children of the foolish man and the wise man. Now, let's read this here, Matthew 7, 24, 27. Beginning at verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these things of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And we stop there for a moment. We learn that it is wise to build upon the rock. It is wise to not only hear the word of God, but to do it. James said, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. James 1, verse 22. Certainly it is important to hear the word of God because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. But if we stop there, if we hear and believe and we stop and we don't go ahead and do what God says, that is not only, that's not wise and it is utterly foolish. Now, the word rock here in Matthew 7, verse 24, is from the same Greek word that Jesus used in Matthew 16, 18, Petra, referring to a ledge of rock. It is also the same word that the Holy Spirit gave through Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse Number four, regarding the children of Israel, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. It's the same Greek word as Jesus uses here in Matthew 7, of the wise man who built upon the rock, and the same Greek word that the Lord used in Matthew 16, 18, when he said, upon this rock, Petra, a ledge of rock, not just a stone, but a ledge of rock. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, Jesus Christ is the rock-solid foundation. Now, I probably mentioned this before about going to Israel in December of 99. And my favorite day of the tour was the day that we went to the Sea of Galilee and then later on went northward to a place called Benice Springs, which we know more properly as Caesarea Philippi. They believe that was the site, rather, of ancient Caesarea Philippi. And for good reason. It was a, a side of a mountain or a hill that was a ledge of rock. And one of the interesting things about that to me was, not only, of course, uh, there the context of Matthew 16 where Christ said, I will be upon this rock, I will build my church. He and the apostles were at Caesarea Philippi, according to verse 13, when the Lord made that promise. When he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. But out from under that mountain or that ledge of rock, issued a stream of water, it was called Benai Springs, forming the headwaters of the Jordan River. Now think about that. From Christ flows the living water, which if a person drink thereof, he shall never thirst. He told the woman at the well there in the context of John 14, verse 13 and 14, referring to the fact that only Christ and His salvation can fully satisfy. And that water of life referring to salvation, the blessings that are in Christ, in and through Him. But out from under that rock came those springs where Jesus promised upon this rock, I will build my church. Indeed, living waters come forth from the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the rock. Over there in the book of John, the fourth chapter, Jesus said to the Samaritan woman there at the well, verse 14, But whosoever drinketh the water that I shall give him, 
shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Before the close of the Bible, Revelation 22, 17, and the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. The water of life. That is the salvation that only comes in and through Jesus Christ. But now going back to Matthew chapter 7, as we continue on with the parable here, verse 25, And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for, here's the reason, it was founded upon a rock. It was built on the rock. The rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, directly upon it. But it did not fall. Why? It was built upon the rock. All the force of the rain and the floods and the wind could not destroy or bring that house down. Why? It was established upon the rock. Now we see a great spiritual lesson here. There are many trials and troubles, tribulations, persecutions, and things that come against us in this life and beat upon our house as it were, as individuals, as homes, as families, as marriages, and the life that we live. But the question is, are we going to stand the test? Yes, if we build on the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The rock of Jesus Christ can withstand any storm. And Psalm 46 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And as the psalmist also said in another passage, Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. That is the Lord himself. He is the rock that is higher than we are. Those who hear and obey the words of Jesus Christ are building on the rock. Now, the storms of life are going to come. They're going to be upon us. The man Job, the man of God, said that Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Job 14, 1. And if you've lived long enough, you know that's true. That no matter how righteous you may live, there's still going to be trouble from time to time. Life is not going to be a bed of roses. There's going to be trouble. There's going to be trouble along the way. But by holding to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and His Holy Word and humble obedience, we will withstand the test. We will make it through. As Paul said, if God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. Now let's read the rest of the parable, verses 26 and 27. We read of another kind of builder here. This one was not wise. Let's see why. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Mega in the Greek. Great. It was terrible. We may do great things for the Lord, we may do greatly by humbling ourselves, trusting and obeying Him, but we also may involve ourselves in great foolishness and suffer a great fall because we do not listen to the Lord and obey His will. This house was brought down by the rain, the floods, and the wind, and it represents one who hears the Lord's word but fails to do it. While it is exceeding wise, my friends, to hear and do the will of God, it is exceeding foolish not to do His will. How many lives, futures, marriages, homes, and so forth have been crumbled and brought down to the ground 
because people have failed to listen to and obey the Lord God. Where have we failed, it is sometimes asked. Jesus gives the answer. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you, Matthew 6, 33. Did you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Did you do what the Lord said is the first and great commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength, Mark 12, 30. Well, Jesus said if we do, we will keep his word. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, verse 15. As a song we often sing, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. The Lord said to his disciples in John 13, 17, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. If we do the Lord's will, we're going to find true happiness and most importantly, salvation and eternal life. In 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. But now, my friends, I'd like to go over to another rendering of this great teaching of the Lord, this time in the book of Luke. Luke, the sixth chapter, and beginning at verse 46. Again, the Lord lays the foundation for this teaching in verse 46, in that we must do his will we must obey him he asked and why call you me lord lord and do not the things which i say why do you call me lord lord but do not treat me as your lord by obedience to my will why do you utter this in vain lord lord if you don't really mean it? why do you say this if you're not going to do my will again the parable whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. It was built on the rock. Thus all the storms that would come against it could not shake it and destroy it because it was built upon the rock. Again, building on the rock is connected with obedience to Christ and His Word. We must not only hear but do the will of the Lord. The word do, while a very small word, we learn as a child, D-O, do. It's a very big word. It's a very important one that we do the will of God. But now, let's look at verse 48. He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Again, we read that. This man digged deep. He digged deep. That's powerful, isn't it? Someone has said God is not to be found on the surface. We must dig deep. You know, my friends, we need more deep digging in the Lord's church. And I don't mean taking digs at one another either. The Bereans were commended by God because they dig deep into God's Word. Here's what Luke says in Acts 17, 11. These, the Bereans that is, were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Paul urges Timothy to dig deep into the word of God. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a woman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We must work at the word of God. We must dig deep into it. Moreover, we need to put everything into worship and not treat it lightly and haphazardly. Surely we are to worship God according to the truth, the Word of God, and we are to worship Him in spirit. Jesus said God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. There are many people that go through the motions of doing what is scriptural worship according to the truth. But they are not worshiping God in spirit because they're not putting everything into it. 
They're not worshiping him as one who loves the Lord God with all of heart, soul, mind, and strength. We also need to dig deep when it comes to our prayers. Let's take a look at what Paul said in Colossians, the fourth chapter, and verse number 12 regarding Epaphras. We read of Epaphras there in the first chapter, Colossians, verse 7, but we also read of him in chapter 4, verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, Salute if you always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. <clears throat> he strove in prayer in behalf of the Colossians. He labored fervently for them in prayer. Now, friends, we as Christians know what it means to labor in prayer, don't we? You let something very serious or tragic befall you in life, you learn what it means to labor in prayer. You know that it was said that when Brother David Lipscomb passed away that the morticians found calluses on his knees. Brother Lipscomb lived during a time when the mechanical instruments of music invaded and divided the Lord's church. No doubt he was troubled by this and many other things that caused him to get on his knees and pray to God. James speaks of the fervent prayer of a righteous man. Fervent. James 5, 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Yes, it must be the prayer of the righteous, those who are faithful. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil, 1 Peter 3, 12. But it must be the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man that availeth much. You let one of your children be near death's door. Or something else heart-rending happening in your life. You know what it means to labor fervently in prayer, don't you? That's the way we should be praying, not only regarding tragedy and trouble in our family and the home, but also regarding the souls of others, including our own spiritual welfare. This is what Epaphras did. He labored fervently in prayer for his brethren and their spiritual growth in the Lord. Yes, we need to labor fervently in prayer. We need to dig deep. We need to strive, that is agonizomai in the Greek, to enter in the straight gate. For many will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Luke 13, 24. That is, put everything into it. To agonize. To muster all effort to enter in the straight gate. We need to dig deep and build on the Lord's word in winning souls and seeking and saving those that we need to teach God's word. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19, verse 10. You know also in that same chapter, the Bible says concerning the city of Jerusalem that the Lord wept over it. The Greek word is klau, that is to weep, as to burst into tears, as one would do at the news of the loss of a loved one. That will lead us to seek the loss. No doubt there were many in Jerusalem who rejected the Lord, who opposed Him. They were His enemies. But he didn't hate them, he wept over them. We should be so concerned over the lost soul. We read of Christ that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man, Hebrews 2, 9. And he proved his love and concern for the lost soul. In the story of the prodigal son, the father said, when the son humbly came home and begged his forgiveness, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Luke 15, 24. That portrays to us the joy of God when a soul comes home to Him. Indeed, it is a serious matter, a lost soul. James said, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins, James 5, verse 19 and 20. Yes, also we need to dig deep when it comes to helping one another. We read of a man in 2 Timothy chapter 1, another man who is not 
well known usually, like Epaphras, but no doubt he was a great and godly man like Epaphras. This man was by the name of Onesiphorus. In 2 Timothy 1, 16 to 18, Paul said, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. Pause there for a moment. It would have been easier for Onesiphorus to sort of avoid Paul while he was under persecution, being bound by Rome as a prisoner, so that he himself would not fall into persecution. But he didn't do that. He was not ashamed of Paul, his brother in Christ. But, verse 17 says, when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. He could have said, well, I, I made, I looked for Paul, I just couldn't find him. But Paul was sought after by Onesiphorus. Onesiphorus on 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 kept on seeking after Paul till he did find him. And this is what he says in verse 18. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, Thou knowest very well. And friends, we need to dig deep in keeping all of God's will, in keeping all that the Lord has commanded, Matthew 28, 20, and not shunning to declare the whole counsel of God, Acts 20, verse 27. That means to mark and avoid those that bring doctrines and divisions into the church. Mark them because division and offense is contrary to the doctrine that you have learned and avoid them. Romans 16 and 17. That means according to the name of Christ to withdraw ourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received of us. 2 Thessalonians 3 16. That means to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Jude, verse number 3. It means to warn the unruly, to comfort the feeble-minded, to support the weak, and to be patient toward all men. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse number 14. As we conclude today, building on the sure foundation, we cannot be on the rock of Jesus Christ in solid ground without being on the church which he built upon the rock. When he said to Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and those others there in his hearing that day. He was referring to the rock-solid truth that Peter had confessed in verse 16. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He was not referring to Peter, whose name is from Petros, a stone. And he speaks directly to Peter in the second person, according to grammar. I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. But then when he speaks of the rock, he speaks in the third person. I say unto thee, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The rock, solid truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We started off talking about Noah in the beginning of our lesson. Noah and his family were saved from the flood. They were saved from destruction. And the only way that we can be in the ark of safety spiritually is to be in the church of our Lord. The Lord adds a save to the church, Acts 2, 4, 7. He is the head of the Savior of the body of the church, Ephesians 5, 23. The only way to have salvation in Christ and to be safe against the storms of life is to build on Jesus Christ and obedience His holy word and to be a part of his one body of the church. He said, upon this rock I will build my church, not the denominations of men, not the world religious systems, but the church of our Lord of which we read in the New Testament. And my friends, there's only one way to do that, and that is to hold fast to the form or pattern of sound words. Paul said to Timothy, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 1 and verse number 13. We've studied today about two builders. One of them carefully prepared and laid his foundation upon the rock. The other, no doubt, did not intend to build on a flimsy foundation, but he was careless, like many people in the religious world, like many people in the world. He was careless. And so when the storms came, his house fell. 
and especially on the judgment day will the house of those who have not built on Christ the rock fall and be destroyed eternally. <coughs> Let us not be like the foolish man. Let us be like the wise man. This is the greatest thing you can do for your family, your children, your loved ones, your friends, and those all about you, is to build on the rock of Jesus Christ. This morning, my friends, if we have any here who need to come and render obedience to the gospel, hearing and believing the word, repentance, confessing Jesus Christ, Son of God, Acts 2.38, Acts 18.8, Acts 8.37, and be baptized in His name for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. We encourage you to do that. If you've done that, but you realize that you have not been building on the rock, that you've been like the foolish man building on the sand, and that you in your life cannot stand the test unless and until you come back to the Lord. And today you need to repent and pray God's forgiveness. As we have the divine pattern laid down in Acts 8 that Simon needed to do, which he did do. We invite you to come while we stand and we sing again. Jesus.